Okay. We're glad that you are here in worship. Now that I started, you should be able to log in to the event code. While we can, turn around and wave to the people around you and just say hello. Hello, good morning, everyone. Get your eye and say hello. We're glad for you to be here this morning as you enter into worship today.
Extraordinary men and women went before us with unmatched resilience. Sorry. Enduring hardship. When called upon to defend and live forever, they said yes. They found courage to rise with every sun. Loyalty for their country. Discipline for every command. Even in the darkest hours, they said, yes. They cherished and fought for freedom to those coming behind them for a sure hope. And when the moment came for them to give it all, their futures never to be read, they said, yes. Today, we think upon their sacrifice and find our way to honor saying yes to making the most of what they gave us and filling the earth with God's goodness. We thank them for their yes. They will never be forgotten. This Memorial Day weekend, we want to uh, honor the memory of those that have made that ultimate sacrifice. We're thankful for men and women who have paid that ultimate price that we might have this very freedom today. Uh, here in just a moment, we're going to share the memorial role of those of, uh, of the Church of the Nazarene that we, we remember as members of our church. But, but before we do that, I, I wonder if there's anybody that has a loved one a family member, an aunt, an uncle, a distant relative, or even a, even a friend that you know of that paid that ultimate price, uh, that sacrificed in, uh, in the cause of freedom, and, uh, and you'd like to honor their memory. If so, would you just stand? I'm just going to ask you to, to call out their name right where you stand this morning. If you're online and you're watching, you can go to the, the chat bar and you can uh, type in that name, and, and uh, we're going to together honor those that have paid that ultimate price. Anybody here this morning, just stand right where you're at and, and uh, tell us somebody that you would like for us to honor their memory of the sacrifice they made. My two great uncles and brothers killed in action in World War II, one in France, one in South Pacific. Payne J. Dunn, Howard H. Dunn. Okay. The Dunn brothers, Grant's great uncles, killed in action. Anybody else? And we celebrate as well those that uh, have uh, been a part of our church on this Memorial Day weekend. Members of this uh, local congregation who have gone before. And so we remember the following individuals. Theta Barrows, Dan Mappus, Jim Moratz, and Eva Puskin. All of these have received a Memorial Roll Certificate. We normally gather them to the front of their families and, and uh, pass them a certificate on this day. Uh, but all of those certificates have been mailed to those families. And uh, this day, we honor their memory. We honor the sacrifice that they made in the cause of the kingdom and the work of God and the church triumphant. So we honor those members of our church that this year have gone on to be with the Lord. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we are so grateful for men and women all across our world, all across this great country that have said yes, that have paid that ultimate price. And on this Memorial Day, we honor their memory, even by gathering to worship on this beautiful Memorial Sunday. We honor the memory of our family members, of our, our church members that have, have been committed. They too have said yes to the call of Christ and, and given 
sacrificially to the kingdom in many realms, in many aspects, for many years. So we ask, oh God, that you would bless the memory of these families, of those loved ones suffering the loss of this past year. And oh God, our hearts turn towards our loved ones on this Memorial Day as, as we think of those that uh, that have been struggling and, and dealing with loss. And, and uh, we continue to, to lift up the Lions family. And, and uh, we got word yesterday that, that David Elkins passed away. And, and our hearts break for the Elkins family as, as we weren't able to be there because of this virus. And weren't able to, to spend time with them. But, but, oh God, we know that your sweet Holy Spirit makes up the difference. Intercedes where we can't be does and says that we can't do. So God, we trust you. We believe in you. And we ask, oh God, that as we honor these memories of these individuals, that you might be glorified. For, oh Lord, you first and foremost said yes. Said yes to, to taking on uh, the humanity. Said yes to taking on the, the cruel cross, the crucifixion. Said yes to, to Giving your life, shedding your blood, that we might truly be free. Help us, Lord, to honor your memory. All that is said in Christ's name. All God's people said. Amen. Scripture tells us that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen? Amen. Amen. Oh, I, I, you will be saved. Amen? Amen. 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 My life is in you, O oh Lord. Let's sing it together this morning. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord.
Good morning. If you're saved and you know it, say amen. amen. If you're saved and you know it, wash your hands. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, uh, it's great to, uh, to have you with us this morning in person or online. Either way, you've chosen to worship with us this morning. We are so glad that you are here. We thank God for you. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you again for your your continued faithfulness. You've been faithful to to watch online and, and participate in, in some of our online feeds, whether that be on Wednesday night with our uh, our Bible studies, with our uh, youth program, our children's ministry. Several of you are engaged in some of those, and and, uh, and thank you for that. We see you on there, and, and we get your feedback. Uh, and, and then you you chose as we come through this kind of a different time to be socially distant and, and uh, spreading ourselves out and, and uh, you know not, not doing some of the things that we normally like to do but but in all of it you continue to be faithful and I want to say thank you thank you thank you 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 continue to be faithful in in, uh, in your prayers you continue to be faithful in, in worshiping with us either online or in person and you also continue to be faithful in your giving and I, I want to say thank you for that because it enables us as a church to continue to do the things that, uh, that we're able to do in ministering to the needs of people, in meeting certain needs that come up as a result of, of this crisis. And, and uh, we've been able to, to not have to, to reach out to the congregation, not have to beg for, for extra resources or extra funds. Uh, but because of your continued generosity and giving, uh, we, we thank you for that. We're able to continue to minister even though we are socially distant and even though we're where some are at home and some are here, uh, we continue to be able to minister. So again, those of you that are here worshiping in person, we're not passing the offering plate, too many hand points, too many touch points. So there is a, an offering box right over here. You notice that uh, as you came in, thank Ken uh, Van Cooten for building that for us, a beautiful offering box that we'll probably continue to use even into the future. And uh, so if you brought your offering, uh, just feel free to drop that in there. And again, those of you at home, you can continue to give online. You can continue to mail your 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 offerings into the church. Uh, but uh, thankfully, thank God, uh, this is not a plea for money. We're not we're not begging for money because you have been you have been faithful in giving, and, and we have an opportunity just to continue to to say say thank you. Well, if you brought your Bible with you this morning, have it there at home with you. Uh, turn with me uh, to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians, the second chapter, and uh, we'll begin reading at, at verse 19. And we're going to begin kind of a theme of, uh, of a series of, of messages that I want to develop over the next several weeks entitled Making the Connection. Uh, it's a, it's a, a theme that I want us to, for the next several weeks, uh, develop and uh, talk about what it means to connect and how we connect and, and what's the importance of, of making the connection. Uh, the, there's, there's four biblical narratives that I'll, I'll address and they give us, they paint for us pictures of what being connected is really all about. And especially during this time in the midst of this pandemic when we have been separated, I think a lot of times one of the things that we long for and we, we look for is realizing uh, that how much we are connected, how much it, how important it is for us to connect. And uh, whether that's through a text or whether that's through a phone call or whether that's through a, a video chat or a Zoom meeting or, or an in-person uh, parking lot distance wave to each other and greet one another, uh, we realize that we are people of community. God created us to be in communion, to be in communion with him, to be in communion with others. He gave us that desire, and we realize that, that only as we begin to make the connection do these points come together, and we begin to sense and know what it is to live and have a fulfilled life. So this morning, uh, out of the book of Ephesians, the second chapter, and, and would you just do for, for me this morning, uh, would you stand with us for the reading of God's Word? Whether you're here in person or online at home, uh, just, I know just push out of that lazy boy, just go ahead and uh, push right up and, uh, and stand up uh, 
kind of keep the habit of, of, uh, of reading the Word of God, if you're able this morning, reading the Word of God together. It says these words. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 19, says, Consequently, you are no longer for foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Jesus Christ Himself as the chief cornerstone. In Him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. In Him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. Let's pray together for a moment. Father, thank you. Thank you for this, your word, and I pray, God, that you would speak to us by the power of your word. May it, may it cut to our heart, may it apply in our lives. May it not be what I want to say, not what we want to hear. May it not tickle our ears, but may it speak truth into our life, into our situation, and our circumstance. In Jesus' precious and holy name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So the first uh, picture... that God's Word makes about making the connection is this image of a building. I don't know about you, but I, I, love, I love to be in and around construction sites. I, I love to see things being built. Uh, just right over across the, behind the church here and around the church is, is several homes being built. And, and it's fun to watch, watch things begin to develop as, as they first begin to, to prepare the land and as they begin to cut in the roads and, and, and make the curves and as they begin to lay the foundation and, and prepare the site and, and then build upon that. And, and it sometimes it seems like overnight a, a house pops up. Well, especially since we haven't been around here much, all of a sudden you drive by and all of a sudden you see a couple of houses over here uh, uh, just uh, south of the church and and uh, even some out west of the church behind us going up. And, and it, just begins to, it just begins to grow. And, and, and the picture here is, is a picture of a building. And we all realize and understand that if we're in any part of construction or been around or even walk in this building and, and, and look up or, or look up in your house, you, you can begin to see all the elements that come together to create a building. A structure, your beautiful home that you're you're sitting in in your living room right here this morning, or this this beautiful gymnasium that uh, that has been filled with kids and upwards and, and youth activities and, and kids nights and, and all sorts of things. It, it comes together under the elements of a foundation, walls, roof, structure, interior fixtures. All these elements come together to form. Something that is useful and beneficial. And the scripture gives us this image that, that as we connect, as we make the connection, it, it is this image of, of a, a building. And first of all, it tells us that the foundation, the floor, the, the concrete floor under your carpet or, or under this gym floor is, is that foundation that is, is laid. And the scripture tells us that, that the foundation it is first and foremost of that of the, it is built on the foundation, verse 20, of the apostles and the prophets. Those that have gone before us, the disciples that come and into the ministry of Jesus Christ shared the, the good news, were, the good, good news was shared to them, and, and they shared it to others. And, and also the prophets of the Old Testament, as God spoke into to people like Elijah. And, and the great prophets, as, as they, they began to work and minister in the, the Word of God amongst God's people, and, and that foundation was laid. And this is why we, we in the church don't throw out the Old Testament. And this is why we don't just dismiss directives of Scripture simply as, as cultural norms. And this is why tradition and history within the church is vital. You know, in, in the Church of Nazarene, Wesley came up uh, with uh, with a series of, of elements that we talk about as Wesley's quadrilateral. Uh, and and it's, it's how we determine truth. 
And first of all, is it is it scriptural? Is it based on the, the word of God? Second of all, is it reasonable? Is it, is it is it something that we can reason? God gave us a brain to think. Uh, we we reason. It's not by the removal of our brain, but it's by the renewal of our brain. Uh, next, it's it's by the experience. What what we can experience? Do we experience this truth? being revealed in our life. And last but not least, it, it, it is also developed upon the tradition of the church. I share this a lot of times in our membership class, and I talk about the fact that, that all of a sudden you've got a brand new revelation that you have discovered that nobody's ever heard of, that no, no, no church tradition or no church historian has ever, has ever realized. Sometimes we think, oh, wow, I want to be the person that, that comes up with that brand new revelation. But if it's not been found in the history of the church, then, then you might want to be cautious about buying into something that you just discovered all by yourself. Because there is, there is the history of the church. There is the foundation, what, what Ephesians tells us, of the prophets and the apostles. And that's why we don't just throw out the Old Testament. That's why we don't just throw out those directives that, that are given to us clearly in God's Word about, about where our life should, should form and, and the way we should carry out our lives within community because they are a part of our foundation. Sometimes so many people want to just say, well, you know, hey, that's, that's just old tradition. That's just the old way of thinking of things. That's just the old way of doing things. But God's Word says that is a part of of our foundation. So we can't just excuse things as, as cultural. We can't just say, oh, well, this is a new day and a new world, and, and so we'll just pass all those things away from us. No, it is the foundation of who we are. And God has been working since the beginning of time, since the beginning in the Garden of Eden. He's been working, developing that foundation through the prophets, Elijah, Jeremiah, through the disciples, Paul, oh, Peter, John, through the, the work of the church triumphant, not just the church of the Nazarene, but the church of Jesus Christ, pulling us all together, developing that first and foremost foundation. So verse 20 says, we're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone, as the primary piece of the foundation. The primary cornerstone of that structure. In him, verse 21 tells us, that the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple of the Lord. You see, in him, it's all tied together. And that's one of the things that happens in construction. And especially in, in construction of large buildings. There is some connection point. Footers go down into the soil, which are tied together with steel and concrete. And many times that steel that goes up into a high-rise building or a, a taller building, it is connected. The, the steel that's in the ground is also connected to the upright post. Some way, somehow, these columns in this building that are tied in and, and poured down into the, the foundation. They are bolted in and, and secured to this, this foundation, which ties it all together. Because the more that it is tied together, the more that it is unified, the stronger it is. And the scripture tells us that the, the scarlet thread that goes from beginning to end, the thing that streams its way through the Old Testament, the New Testament, through the prophets, through today, is Jesus Christ. He is that scarlet thread. All of the Old Testament looks at, towards the atoning act of the cross of Jesus Christ. All of the things that happened in the New Testament after the crucifixion of Jesus look back to that, that defining moment, that defining point in which the scarlet thread of Jesus Christ ties it all together. You remember on the road to Emmaus after the, cru after the crucifixion and the resurrection, Jesus is walking with some of the disciples. They don't recognize who he is, and, and they're talking back and forth. And, and then in verse 20, chapter 24, verse 25, Jesus says to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe that all that the, the things that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Verse 27 tells us, Jesus says, and beginning, or the word the scripture tells us, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them 
all that was said in the scriptures concerning himself. You see, from the very beginning, there's this scarlet thread that ties it all together. And it ties us as the people of God together. It unifies us. It connects the dots. It ties us in to the body, the building of Christ. Last but not least, verse 22 tells us, in Him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. You too, the scripture says, are being built together. I want you, if you have, if you have a, a way to underline that, highlight that in your, your Bible, or on your Bible app, highlight especially that word together. It says you are being built together. Together. Not individually. Not separate, not all by your lonesome. There's, there should be no such thing as a lone range of Christian. There should no, be some, no such thing as, as a, us just experiencing God all by ourselves. Because the scripture says this image of making the connection, this image of, of the building that God builds in us and through us is that we are being built, laid on the foundation of the prophets, Jesus, the chief cornerstone, the scarlet thread that goes through all and connects us all, and we are being built together. You see the different parts of the building, the floors, the wall, the roof, the windows, the doors, the fixtures, all together, tied together in Christ to become the place where God lives. The problem is that, that here in this day and age, and, and especially in these United States, we, we have this, this concept of, of individualism. It's all about me. I'm my own person. I make my own decisions. I live my own life. I do what I want. It's about my rights. It's about my life. It's about what I want. There was a sociologist by the name of Robert Bell. And he took a poll that kind of shed some light on this paradox of the fact that there is an increased religiosity in our world today but a decreased morality. You find it all over the, our world today. There's a lot of people that are, that are hungry for, for spiritual things, but there is an increased religiosity, but a decreased spiritual morality. And, and here's the conclusion of his poll. He said 81% of American people say that an individual should arrive at his or, own, his or her own religious belief independent of a church or synagogue or anyone else. That's the key to this paradox. Those who claim to be Christians arriving at faith all by themselves, all on their own terms, based on what they think, what they feel, what they conclude. Pushing aside the, the history of the church, pushing aside the, the, the prophets, pushing aside what, what God's word says. And, and really, we can come to that point in which we say it's just about me. In, in one of his books, he, he interviewed a, a woman by the name of Sheila. And here's what she said. I, I can't remember the last time I went to church, but my faith has carried me a long way. And she said, Here, here's what it is. It's, it's really that, that inner voice, my own little voice. And, and, and it, it's what she called Shelaism. That became her religion. Yeah, she believes in God, but, but really it's just that, that her own little inner voice that, that speaks to her. And, and, and that's how she carries out her belief in life. One thing that has become evident especially within this pandemic, is that Christianity can become too personal if we're not careful. It can just be about me and my convictions and my interpretation. But the scripture says that we are being built together. We are the dwelling place of the Most High. We are God's temple. We, the body of Christ, 
place where God wants to go. Not just in the individual off by themselves, but as the body of Christ coming together. Not just in a building, not just in a church, not just in a structure, because that, there's so much more to church than a structure. It is us being built together in a community. Doing things because it benefits God. Doing things because it benefits His people. Do you remember dot to dot pictures? For those of you that are at home, I'll email this to you. Send it out by email to everybody this week. But you remember dot to dot pictures and the kid, and all of you, all of you have one there, and uh, each of these dots could represent different people, different situations, different places, different times. Maybe they're points in time, or, or points on a map, or, or access points in life. Maybe they're points to ponder, or they're pointed questions, or, or they point you in the right direction, or it's a point of view, or a turning point, or, or maybe a tipping point, or, or maybe a boiling point, or, or maybe a point to no return. I'm not trying to labor the point, but but to be point blank. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that it's all about making connections. Get the point? It's all about making connections. All of these are connected by lines. And, and you know the drill. You start at one, and you draw your line to two, and you, you keep going around through them, and you move on to, down the way. And, and, and you can't skip steps. You can't skip numbers. Oh, you can't be at number 33 and say, hey, wow, 55 is really close. Let me just go over there. I mean, you could, <coughs> but it's probably not going to turn out. And so you have to learn to trust the process. You have to learn to trust God, who is that connecting line that connects others. These may be points in your life. It may be other people in your life. Each one of these points could represent a period of time in your life or a situation or circumstance in your life. But as you begin to draw the line, as the Spirit of God connects all of those points together, other people, situations, and circumstances, then and only then can we make sense when we work together, when we work as a body of Christ, when we realize that it's not just about me and, and where I want to go and what I want to do. And it begins to make sense when God takes all of these points, all of these people, all of these situations, and ties them all together. Then and only then can we see the big picture. Then and only then can we realize, and if you'll take the time to connect those dots, Sometime you'll realize the little picture is that we're better together. We're better together. We're better in community. We're better when we love God and we love other people. We're better when we allow God to lead us and direct us and put all the points together. And we glorify His holy name. Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes with me for a moment? And could we pray together? Our Father and our God, we thank you. We thank you for this amazing day that you have given to us. We thank you, oh God, that you, you love us and, and you care for us and, and you work out all the details. And, and God, there's a lot of points on the map of our life and, and lots of things that don't make sense. And, and, and some of these points are tipping points or, or turning points or boiling points. And, and some of these points put us in a situation or circumstance where, where we feel like it doesn't all make sense. Oh God, help me, help us 
to trust you, to trust that scarlet thread that winds its way through our life and through our situations and circumstances that creates in us the reality that we are better together. We're better with you. We're better with others. We're better with the family of God. In Jesus' precious and holy name. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Our worship team is going to come and lead us in, in kind of our, our theme song. And, and uh, I'm hoping this is going to stick in your head. And uh, remember that uh, there's, there's always... There is always hope. Hey, thank you for, for choosing to worship with us online, in person. Uh, we're going to do it kind of like we did last week. I'm not going to call the road, but we're just going to let the first row be dismissed, and then the next row, and the next row. Again, the offering box is over here if you want to go that way and, and drop that. Wait till you get outside at a social distance space to, to say hi to some folks and greet some people. Uh, thank you for sharing with us. But remember, there is always, always hope. Hope when you face the darkness. Hope when the night is hard as hell. Like a new day dawning, don't give up. Keep holding on to the road. It's the strength that behind you is more. And it's what defines you. When it seems you just can't go on. There's always hope when you face the darkness. Thank you.